Hi, my name is Justin Menko. I'm based in Detroit, Michigan, and I'm a technical product specialist with Azure Biosystems. Today, I will be discussing the use of total proteins versus the use of housekeeping proteins for the normalization of Western blots. Azure has been around for a number of years now, and our mission is to help provide researchers with raw data images that they can trust. We achieved this through the provision of gel and Western imaging systems, as well as a reagent workflow. Now, Western blot is a technique used by many labs to study a specific protein of interest within a complex mixture of proteins. The process starts by loading and running a gel to separate proteins based on size. Researchers then transfer the proteins to a membrane and use a primary antibody to probe for a particular protein of interest. Researchers then apply a secondary antibody, which will determine how they detect their Western blot data in the end. There are actually a number of steps along the way that could introduce variability. And researchers that are quantifying proteins of interest want to make sure that any increases or decreases in protein intensity are directly related to what's happening biologically. Now, there are a few steps in the protocol that could cause for an artificial increase or decrease in the intensity or the observed intensity of a particular protein. The first step is loading errors. You want to make sure that any increase or decrease in the intensity of protein is not directly related to unevenly loading proteins on your gel. Different parts of the membrane could transfer less efficiently than others. This could directly impact the amount of signal intensity observed in the downstream imaging step. Again, normalization helps researchers to control for both of these variables. When it comes to normalization, researchers usually use one of two commonly used methods, housekeeping proteins or total protein stains. Now, housekeeping proteins look at the signal intensity of a single protein here. These proteins are highly expressed and usually include actin, GAPDH, or tubulin. Furthermore, it is believed that these proteins are not changed with experimental conditions. Total protein, by contrast, looks at the intensity of protein within an entire lane of a sample. This helps researchers to correct for variation in protein load, and it can also help to diagnose any transfer inefficiencies. Furthermore, with total protein stains, researchers can actually stain their membrane and image it immediately after transferring and right before the antibody incubation. This allows researchers to validate that a successful transfer was achieved prior to proceeding towards costly antibody and timely antibody incubation steps. Now, when it comes to selecting between the two, of course, there's going to be experimental variables that will help determine which one our lab will utilize. With that said, many peer-reviewed journals, as well as the NIH, are now suggesting that researchers use total protein for normalization instead of housekeeping proteins. Now, it's not just one journal in particular, it's multiple. The JBC says housekeeping proteins should not be used for normalization without evidence that manipulations do not affect expression. Here, what they're saying is that validation needs to occur to ensure that experimental conditions do not change the expression of these proteins. They also say that a linear relationship between signal intensity and the mass or volume of a sample loaded must be confirmed for each antigen. Proteomics says total protein staining represents the actual loading amount more accurately than housekeeping proteins due to minor technical and biological variations. Nature says that loading controls like GAPDH and actin must be run on the same blot. Sample processing controls run on different gels must be identified as such and distinctly from loading controls. Now for labs using housekeeping proteins for normalization, usually rely on one of three different workflows. The first is the use of stripping and reprobing. In a strip and reprobe protocol, researchers will first probe for their protein of interest and then strip that protein antibody complex off of their membrane. 
and follow it up with a second round of antibody probing for the housekeeping protein that they will use for their normalization. Now there's a lot of data suggesting that membrane stripping and reprobing is a quantitative trade-off between antibody removal and total protein loss. It's documented that strip protocols actually remove protein of interest in addition to removing the target antibody complex from the membrane. This puts researchers in a challenging situation as they don't know how much protein of interest is actually removed from the membrane. To avoid having to use a strip and reprobe protocol, researchers will cut their membrane horizontally across a region that does not have any protein of interest. One of the membranes will then contain their protein of interest and the other membrane will contain their housekeeping protein. Researchers will probe each of these blots independently. The challenge here is that within a single experiment, these two samples are being treated differently and not identically. This interjects another variable that needs to be controlled for. For labs that don't wanna run a strip and reprobe protocol and also don't wanna cut their membranes, these labs will oftentimes run two duplicate membranes. The challenge here is that each of these membranes is assumed to be an identical replicate of the other, but controls need to be established to make sure and validate that this is actually the case. Furthermore, you don't avoid the challenge mentioned in the previous scenario of cutting the membrane. Each of the two membranes is not going to be treated identically and therefore will interject further variability into the experiment. Ultimately, this is why nature suggests or recommends that this needs to be documented if this is being performed as a methodology for normalization. Now researchers using chemiluminescence and housekeeping protein normalization methodologies should be aware of enzyme kinetics. Um, these enzyme kinetics are introduced in the HRP step of a chemiluminescent reaction. If you look at the graph on the left, we plot signal intensity versus the protein load or protein concentration loaded into each well. The expectation being that as protein concentration increases, we should also see an increase in signal intensity. Well, on this graph, we plot four different substrates and the relationship between signal intensity and the protein loaded. Unfortunately, what we see here is for some of the substrates, the signal intensity actually decreases as the protein load increases. Looking at the image on the right, we're seeing a representation of what this looks like in a blot. In the middle of some of the higher expressed bands, we're actually seeing a decrease or a lack of signal. This is called ghost bending or burnout. What we're, we're observing here is the fact that there is so much protein on a membrane that there are simply not enough reagents in the ECL to keep the reaction going. Now, why does this matter for normalization or housekeeping proteins? Well, housekeeping proteins are often highly expressed proteins. It's very critical to make sure that you're operating within the linear dynamic range of your substrate if you're using chemiluminescence and housekeeping proteins for normalization. For researchers that are interested in reevaluating their normalization practices and potentially updating them, there are a few options. In the last slide, I talked about how chemiluminescence is not necessarily linear, especially when you get up into higher protein concentrations. Again, this is due to enzyme activity. One of the way researchers can update their normalization step is to transition from chemiluminescence to fluorescence. Fluorescence, by contrast, does not rely on enzymes to generate signal. Instead, it relies on excitation light sources and emission filters to detect signal. This generates a more linear signal response over a greater concentration of proteins. For researchers that don't necessarily want to transition to fluorescence, but still want to update their normalization method, Azure offers a total protein stain called Azure Red. The image on the left is of a blot that has been labeled with three commonly used housekeeping proteins as well as Azure Red, which is Azure's total protein stain. The intensities of each were then plotted. The plot can be found on the right. When it comes to the housekeeping proteins, one of the things you'll notice is that there's very little signal intensity overall. This is expected 
as the, as the signal intensity is generated only from one protein. When you compare that to Azure Red, you'll notice there's quite a bit more signal intensity overall. That's because we're looking at the intensity of the entire lane rather than just one protein. This generates more data points for comparison and normalization. Furthermore, the linearity of Azure Red or total protein exceeds the linearity of housekeeping proteins. Here's another experiment that it was actually conducted by one of our customers. They compared Azure Red total protein stain to GAP-DH. Again, in this experiment, GAP-DH was labeled with a fluorescent secondary antibody and not chemiluminescence. They also compared it to Ponso stain. Now the graph on the right reflects the plot of each of these respective normalization methods. Again, Azure Red has a very high R squared value as it's a very linear total protein normalization dye. Now the gap DH has an R squared value of just under 0.9, which is quite a bit lower than the Azure Red total protein stain. And Ponso stain actually has the lowest R squared value. One of the big reasons that Ponso has the lowest R squared value is that it's the chemiluminescent equivalent to total protein stains. What I mean by this is that Ponso stain, once applied to the membrane, immediately starts to fade, just like the chemiluminescent reaction starts to fade right after ECL is added to the blot. This fading leads to a, a lack of linearity with respect to the amount of signal intensity generated and the amount of protein on the blot. Although Sponso, Ponso is a quick and easy staining methodology, there are more linear methods available. Overall, peer-reviewed journal suggestions and the NIH are trending towards the use of total protein as the normalization methodology. With that said, each experiment has nuances and variables that may suggest. Overall, peer-reviewed journals and the NIH are suggesting the use of total protein for normalization. With that said, there may be experiments that justify the use of housekeeping proteins. Azure Biosystems can help determine which normalization methodology is best for your lab and your experiment. For more information or to ask specific questions, feel free to contact us through our website at azurebiosystems.com. Thank you for attending this seminar.